Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics, and in this RDS Handgun Fundamentals video, we're going to talk about multiple targets. We call this multiple targets, multiple threats, or just changing point of aim. Had to come up with a very simplistic title uh, to let people know what I was talking about instead of just something very long and very broad. Basically what we're talking about is changing points of aim, which is a very simple process, um, on the outside anyway. Uh, it does tend to cause some difficulty with, with newer red dot shooters, but it's a problem, or I should say a struggle, uh, that we have in shooting in general. Uh, iron sights, magnified optics, and then red dot on the handgun. One of the biggest problems that we tend to run into when changing points of aim, be it, you know, think about you've got two targets set up, or maybe you're just changing points of aim on the same target, say you're going from the chest to the head to the head of the chest, which is a simplistic issue. I find it's... it's somewhat easier to transition on the vertical than it is the horizontal. And then if you have to transition on the horizontal from two targets that are different distances, that can add difficulty to the problem. Uh, of course, another issue that we have is sometimes practicing this skill uh, is not feasible. So if you can only shoot on an indoor range, there's only so much you can do when transitioning between two targets, especially on the horizontal, if you, you know, rent two stalls. and shoot back and forth and I'm sure there'd be some range person in there that would, would for some reason have a problem with that. So uh, it's a skill that sometimes relies a lot on dry fire to develop and if it's not something we normally get to do when we shoot we run the risk of literally forgetting to practice it when we do dry fire. We're talking specifically about the handgun so that's what we're gonna address. Uh, coming from iron sights a lot of people were instructed, and it's a very useful technique for iron sights for a number of reasons, is when it's time to change points of aim, let's so I'm, say I'm going from two separate targets, I'm going to come off the front sight, go target focus, move my eyes, and then track the gun to my eyes, and then refocus on the front sight and begin to shoot, which is, for a number of reasons, a very good way to do it. The main reason we do that is because it allows a fine point of focus so we actually drive the gun to the correct target so we actually get target uh, we're shooting the right target so we're being threat aware or target aware if you will so we get positive id another reason why this is a helpful skill is because being target focused is going to allow for eye hand coordination to do its thing which means the gun is going to be more accurately driven to the target with the red dot handgun, we stay target focused on the same focal plane of whatever we're shooting at the entire time. So there's not as much of a demand to leave the gun because we're literally down range. But depending on the distance to the target, we still want to bring our eyes out of the reticle, if you will, drive them, and then drive the gun over. The main reason, again, guns comes from the previous skill uh, with iron sights is the eye-hand coordination is going to be more finely tuned if we're doing one thing at a time. So if I'm staying in my reticle and driving with the reticle, I have a much higher risk of over-traveling what I'm driving to. Because we're human beings, uh, we're not machines, it's very hard for us to be consistently precise over a long period of time, depending on what skill we're looking at. It would be very easy to set up two targets at the same distance from the same, the same width apart and develop a skill to be able to quickly shoot between this target and that target. We'd be able to practice that. A lot of repetition would develop that skill, but would that skill exist outside of that set distance? Question that we always have to ask ourselves. Did we get proficient at something or did we get proficient at staging something? In dry fire, the best way to practice this skill is to just set up multiple targets. Uh, I use reasonably sized uh, targets like say an A zone size or maybe even slower than that or I can use a B8 or I can use a, um, a simulated distance silhouette so I can start with something that's really close let's say a simulated 10 yard target and I go down to like a 7 and 5 and so on and so forth and I'll just drive the gun from target to target visually. <clears throat> One of the things that I find advantageous about the red dot on the handgun for transitioning between two points of aim is up close I definitely still come out of and then move. So I'm still taking my eyes out of the envelope so to speak or out of the sight picture so to speak, drive them to the target and then bring the gun to my eyes. I find that to be very efficient. As distance increases I find that I don't necessarily have to do that. So if I'm shooting at uh, steel plates or something like that from 25 yards I might not even necessarily need to make that uh, eye and then gun transition because everything is so close together at that distance everything's really compact so if I take two targets and put them 10 feet apart at seven yards that's a big deal at three yards it's an even bigger deal but if I move back to 25 yards 
that distance between the two targets isn't nearly as monumental, so it's very easy for me to stay in the optic and make the transition, and I find that I don't lose any speed to do it. But in dry fire, I want to try varied distances. I don't want to get into kind of rote memorization of the technique. I want to be able to, as often as possible, give myself a visual presentation or a visual situation that I haven't really dealt with before. So I'm going to move the targets further apart, bring them closer together, maybe one higher than the other, so I've got a little bit of transition in there uh, that I'm not... Um, I'm not setting myself up for success. I'm trying to challenge myself as much as possible. When it's time to shoot it, I found that there's a couple different methods that, that uh, help develop the skill. Steel is very helpful for this. However, not everybody's gonna have access to it. But if you do, one of the simplest things you can do is set the steel up uh, and pick a number of rounds. Let's say I'm gonna do 20 rounds. And after I do the 20 rounds, I'm gonna move the steel further apart or maybe set one close and one little bit further back, whatever I'm gonna do. And all I'm gonna do is get a rhythm going. You can include a draw stroke, but what we're really doing here for right now is just a skill isolation. So I might take the draw stroke out of it until I feel comfortable with my transition times between targets. I'm gonna start one and then one, and then one and then one, and then one and then one, and I'm gonna to try to push myself, or I'm not even gonna try, I'm going to push myself faster and faster and faster until I see a consistent failure rate. When I start seeing that consistent failure rate, I know what my speed limit is at that point. That's where my skill development is, that's where I'm at, that's what I have to work on. At that point, I'm gonna to try to maintain that speed and incrementally increase it. One of the things that we don't get from steel necessarily, or at least as easily, is an idea of exactly where we're hitting. So if we're shooting C or B or A zone size steel, like, yeah, we're hitting it, but are we just hitting for the ring or are we hitting for consistent accuracy? And you know, you can see hits on steel to a certain degree, but I find that this is something better to do on paper. Also, I find it helpful to, be, to pay attention to reticle behavior and when I work on paper. On paper, this is a really cool thing to do. Uh, it gives us an idea of reticle behavior, ideal reticle behavior, what kind of acceptable sight picture we can get away with. And there's two approaches to this. One is the idea of follow through. I always want to establish a sight picture after the previous round fired, which comes from defensive shooting. And then from competition shooting, there is the gun can begin to move as soon as the hit needed is gotten. So let's say I have to put two rounds on a piece of steel. I fire one round, I fire the second round, and before I even settle that follow through sight picture, I only needed to get two hits, I got my two hits. I can immediately begin moving the gun as it's still recovering from recoil. That's a very fast and efficient way to transition the gun to the next point of aim. However, it does go against the tactical mindset of establish that final sight picture. So, depending on the ultimate need for your skill, you may approach the technique a different way. If I'm shooting a speed rack, say I've got this six plate speed rack, I fire one round, as soon as I get register, I register that hit, the gun's moving. Or if I know that reticle was perfectly placed, as soon as I pull that trigger, before I've even gotten feedback from the plate being knocked down, the gun is moving. This allows me to steal a little bit of speed from each plate and ultimately give myself a much better time. One thing I notice, I'll shoot from 15 yards and I'll see an average of about two seconds to clear those six plates. If I get a perfect reticle placement and I press the trigger and I'm like, I know that plate's going down and I immediately begin to move the gun, I can bring that down to 1.5 or maybe even a little bit faster depending on the gun I'm shooting because that does factor into it and the ammunition I'm using. So if you want to stay completely self-defense minded, there's nothing wrong with keeping that idea of every round I get follow through sight pitcher. I fire one round, follow through sight pitcher, okay, the plate went down, then I can move. Just be, just be aware that any time you do that, you are adding to the process. There's no way to be as fast with that follow through sight pitcher as you would be if you immediately started to move knowing you were gonna get that hit. So on paper, I'll set up two silhouettes, two A zones. At first, what I'm looking for is just dot behavior. So I'm gonna aim at the first A zone and I'm gonna press a shot and I'm just gonna move the gun to the second A zone but not fire a shot. What I'm looking at, so I'm not focused on the destination of the gun and firing the second shot, what I'm actually looking at is what the dot does as I move to the second A zone. One round, move over to the new point of aim. Or I can do one round, move over to the new point of aim sit with it, one round, move over the new point aim. So I'm going back and forth. I'm not actually firing two shots yet. I'm firing one shot and seeing what the dot's behavior is during my vertical travel or my horizontal travel. I wanna see what a good ideal dot behavior looks like compared to the hit I got. Sometimes as shooters, we get ahead of ourselves. We're already thinking about the second shot and we haven't even fired the first one yet. That's problematic. It lends to uh, some mistakes that we can make. 
once I have a good idea, once I've memorized, I've isolated that good bot behavior, what a good transition dot behavior looks like, once I fit, factor in that recall and decide which method I'm using, establish the final sight picture versus I know I got the hit and move, then I'm gonna begin to add in the second shot and I'm gonna go one and one and one and one and one and one and I'm gonna continue, just like on steel, continue to increase my speed. The smaller the zone I'm aiming for, the more disciplined my, my point of aim has to be and the more, I'd say, the better data I'm gonna get from my final sight. So I may do 10 rounds, I may do 20 rounds, depending on what ammunition I have available to me, especially right now. Uh, ammo's still recovering from being scarce. Uh, so I may only have 10 or 15 or 20 rounds to dedicate this, but even if you dry fire it, you still have to live fire it to confirm and validate that you're actually building on your skill and technique. And the best way to do this was with shot timer. Uh, shot timers definitely serve a purpose, and this is one of them because it gives us a final metric, a disinterested party judging our performance based on a time limit. You can set the time limit or somebody else can set the time limit for you. Very simplistic method. Oh, I, a lot of people, they just want to go set up four or five targets and just all over the place. And that's fine. However, when we're developing a skill, we, we need to take the, the approach of let's isolate what the physical technique is, left to right, right to left, and then build on that. Ultimately, what we're going for, and this is just my philosophy since I'm a self-defense focused instructor, is not necessarily dealing with multiple threats. While that is possible in a self-defense situation, it's much more likely you're going to have one threat and he's going to move around. Now my philosophy on this, and this is why I take the approach of two methods. Some people stay on the competition side of the house and they're like, okay, you can start to move after you know you've gotten that hit. You don't have to wait for follow through that final sight picture. And then of course the other thought is, you always gotta have that final sight picture because that's good tactical self-defense behavior. My thinking is this, single threat, moving. Every single place he moves and I'm able to track him with the gun, that's a multiple threat type of situation, at least as far as sight picture is concerned. So instead of shooting at six pieces of paper or six targets, I'm shooting the same target six times as it moves. One of the problems we have in self-defense shooting uh, in ranges in general is an extreme lack of realism. So the best way to really apply these skills is to take a force on force course. But even if you don't have ready access to force on force, you can use airsoft. I've seen people use paintball and varied other methods, but we need to develop the skill before we start to really test it. So I can set up my three or my four or my five targets, and mentally I can think about it like, oh, I'm confronted by six threats, which again is in the realm of possibility. But like I said, it's much more likely it's just one guy moving around. Bad guy always has a final say in your sight picture. So as he moves, and if you're able to track him fast enough, you get to decide, okay, that I can hit him there, I can hit him there, I can hit him there, I can hit him there. If I set up six targets, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I get an idea of where I'm hitting on each target, it is a little bit unrealistic because chances are you're using a two-dimensional target, uh, paper or a silhouette or something like that, and people don't generally run sideways like that, although again, they can. I generally like to set up 3D targets and I start with an ideal presentation and then a second target's got a slight turn, slight turn, slight turn, slight turn, so I have the idea of a target turning and moving. And that gives me a little bit more 3D appreciation of where I'd have to change my point of aim for an anatomy strike, but that's getting way ahead of ourselves. What I'm gonna do when I set this up is I'm gonna run it a couple different ways. First way is I'm gonna do one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's just use the example we're using six targets. Then I might go one, three, six, or one, two, five, six. Because like I said, he gets a final vote. If he moves really quick, we can't necessarily track every single sight picture and use every single exposure on the target depending on <clears throat> distance and other factors. So I'll set up the six targets, but I'm not always going to shoot one, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, you know, maybe I'll come up with just some kind of just easy um, procedure to follow. So I'll do one, two, three, four, five, six, and then I'll do one, six, and then I'll do two, five, whatever. And I'm going back and forth. Got to be left, got to be right, so I'm able to track targets in both directions. I've seen some shooters that, uh, that shoot steel really, really well, but they can only go left to right. When you have them go right to left, things slow down dramatically because they've just kind of built in a memorization of the technique and they haven't worked in the other direction because maybe it just never occurred to them. So it's always a good idea to shoot from the middle, shoot from the left, shoot from the right, however you're gonna set it up, that on paper or on steel. What we're looking for again is what ideal behavior looks like in the dot between targets. My ideal behavior, round press recoil occurs. If I'm going to reestablish a sight picture, a follow through sight picture before I move to the next target, I'm just gonna let that dot come back into the center of the window. I'm not gonna let it stabilize, but as soon as I see it, and as soon as it references the target, I'm pushing to the next target. If I'm not waiting for follow through, 
as soon as the gun recoils and I'm like, okay, that dot was where I wanted to be when I press the shot. If my fundamentals were on point, that was a hit. As soon as the gun fires, as soon as recoil begins, I'm already pushing the gun. The problem with this technique is while it is faster transition from point of aim to point of aim, the dot is coming back from recoil while the gun is in motion and that does take some getting used to and for some people it is a big struggle because they tend to over travel the gun and then maybe have to move the gun a little bit around to get the dot back where they want it if the distance requires it. There's no shortcut to developing this skill so the best advice I can give is get an idea of what your ideal dot behavior looks like at the size of the target that you want to hit. So if you're always trying to hit critical regions, thinking self-defense purposes, then the dot is going to have to stabilize a little bit more to get that A zone hit, especially as distance increases. If you're only worried about developing the skill for competition's sake, which there's nothing wrong with that, then think about the scoring zones. The A zone I talk about is four by six inches. The A zone you talk about might be considerably larger if you're talking about like a USPSA target or something like that. So what's your ideal scoring zone size? And if you can get away with maybe moving a little bit faster, nothing wrong with that. If you're only gonna shoot steel, what's a small steel you're gonna shoot? The smaller you can hit, moving the gun from left to right, right to left, up to down, whatever, uh, the better the skills to develop. But the, the ultimate recipe here is just like with anything else with the red dot, listen to what the dot is telling you and appreciate what it does and have a recall of what good dot behavior is. So if I shoot, let's say, go back to the steel example, if I'm shooting a plate rack six, ding, 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 ding. I want an idea after I fire that last round and I kind of follow through to think about, okay, what dot behavior did I see when I hit those plates successfully? Compare it to my shot time and be like, okay, that was good dot behavior. I want to memorize that. That's what I want to look for. Generally, the targets will give you good feedback on if you had good dot behavior or not. If I'm shooting on paper and I shoot a lot of B zones when I was trying to hit the A, then that dot behavior wasn't good dot behavior. So I need to think about, okay, how much do I have to allow the dot stabilized? How fast am I trying to go? You have to be able to go efficiently before you can go quickly. So starting out slow is a very good idea. And then building up speed from there. Final advice I can give you is shoot live fire what you dry fired. So if you set something up in the house, try to set something up, targets and everything, that you can actually replicate when you go to a range. Hopefully you're able to do that. Uh, you can set up just a traditional piece of paper and draw points of aim on it on an indoor range and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or whatever you have. Uh, it's a simulation of distance. It's not as realistic because obviously you wouldn't be able to do super close targets. You can only do silhouettes that were projected or simulated distance, say like 15, 20, 25 yards, whatever. So it's a little problematic, but it's better to develop the skill on what you can replicate versus dry firing one thing and then live firing something else. Pay attention to the dot behavior and think about what kind of sight picture you want to use. My advice is to, to know both techniques. Be able to start tracking before follow through occurs and also be able to track after you follow through on a sight picture and move to the next target. And try to make as realistic as possible and eventually, especially if you're self-defense minded, get yourself on a force on force course so you can actually test those skills against a real life human being moving around. I'm Aaron Count with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.